huge apologies to anyone who hasn't made it in today. Uh, very sorry about that. I think this is one of the ongoing things that we've had in the digital world is it works brilliantly when it works brilliantly and when it doesn't. Yeah. I know that so we'll do, uh, Cheetah says we could have done a Hunger Games type of entry. Um, <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, I am tribute. What's, <laughs> is that is cat, a poor cat? Um, yeah, no, I think we can't do it that way because uh, I can't afford to lose any of you. <laughs> it's just important I have you all. Okay, well, I think if we've got Jasper, we've, we'll we'll have to crack on. We have Jasper, and um, no one needs to leave now, and I'll send the video to everybody. Okay, well, we're starting a little bit late, so um, I'm hoping that it, it, I'm hoping everyone isn't too pressed for time. We're uh, we're tweeting today with the hashtag Seawig21. If anyone wants to use that, uh, please be nice about our restricted numbers. <laughs> we're, we're honestly, we, we, we're just, it's a genuine mistake, nothing personal. We're very sorry and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, small bits of housekeeping. Uh, if everyone can please keep their uh, speakers on mute and uh, it's lovely to see faces. So please, you can have your cameras on because it's really nice to see you. And, Please don't complain about any of our uh, any of our backdrops or and please if you wish to do this entire thing dressed as a pirate you may do so. I'd be <laughs> delighted. So we're going to have a quick run round the people that we have today. Most of you um, know me or know um, know a bit about me. I'm the current chair of Seawig. My name is Dawn Finch. You can see it in the bottom corner there. And uh, some of the things that you probably don't know is I'm also a bookseller. Uh, I help run our community bookshop up here in very rural Aberdeenshire. And we're in the process of moving at the moment. Obviously, we've had to go through lockdown and we've had to go through all the same changes as any other booksellers have had to do. So it, one of the things that came up at our CWIG meetings was talking about post-COVID environment for booksellers. And so we came up with the idea of this panel. So the people that I'd like I have on the panel today, you may or may not be able to see them immediately on your camera. Please do scroll through so that you can see them. I have speaker view. If you wish to have speaker view enabled, then you'll see them pop up. If you have gallery view, you'll see that their, their names, their screens will be ringed with green or gold so when they're speaking. So this, today we have with us David Prescott from Blackwells, we have Jasper Sutcliffe from uh, bookshop.org, from UK bookshop.org, and we have Samantha Williams, founder of Book Love. So for a very brief introduction from everyone, I'm going to go through the people one at a time, so their names will be highlighted, their screens will be highlighted, and you can see who they are. So David Prescott from Blackwells first, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Dawn. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm David from Blackwells. Uh, I've been with Blackwells for just over 25 years, so um, uh, quite a while, uh, although actually compared to some of our staff, actually, I'm probably still a bit of a new boy, I would guess, compared to some of our long service. But uh, yeah, I've been with Blackwells 25 years. Um, really done pretty much everything. Started in Nottingham Trent, opening um, boxes and putting books onto the system and have done pretty much every job apart from running Broad Street. I missed that somehow. So I, I never got to run Oxford Broad Street. Um, and I've been chief exec and MD for about eight or nine years now. So uh, for a little while. Um, and I guess we'll talk about the business as we, um, we go on, Dawn. But uh, yeah. We will. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David. Uh, Jasper, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I can't see where Daf Jasper is actually. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, thanks. There for, he is. Here I am. Yes, yeah, so I've made it in. Uh, sorry for kicking somebody out if I had to. That's I feel really bad. Guilty now. Um, uh, my name's Jasper Sutcliffe. Uh, I am currently the um, publisher and affiliate manager at bookshop.org. Like David, I've been in bookselling man and boy. Um, started at Foils 21 years ago, 19, November 99, and like David worked up from the shop floor through to um, head of buying. Um, now I'm at bookshop.org and looking after, as I say, kind of publishers and affiliates, and affiliates include authors, publishers, uh, vloggers, bloggers, um, and everyone who isn't a bookshop, essentially. Lovely, thank you, Jasper. And uh, we have uh, Samantha Williams from uh, founder of Book Love. 
Yeah, I think a lot of you have probably met Samantha in one form or another. Um, Samantha, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm just unmute myself. Hiya. Hey, I've got, there you are. Um, two other people on a. Can you hear me? I've got two other young people on a Zoom upstairs. So if my Wi-Fi goes in and out, please bear with me. Um, so yeah, I'm Samantha. I'm from the Multicultural Travelling Book Carnival. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but we like to make a lot of noise. We go around the country. Well, we used to go around the country with books and multicultural books, inclusive books, and anti-racist books. And I've been doing this on and off for about four years. I fell into it and I love it. I came into back to book selling through the back door. Um, I'm an ex-television producer. That's where I cut my teeth, but I absolutely love publishing and hope to keep doing this and book selling for the rest of my life. And oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. So, um, and thank you very much for all of you coming here. Um, uh, I would be, obviously one of the things that's top on our minds when we're thinking about book selling at the moment is the uh, the post COVID and the COVID environment, because that's had such a huge impact on all of our careers over the last year. There can't be anyone who's escaped without it having an impact on their career. So what I'd like to think about is where we are right now in sort of the beginning of 2021, looking back over the last year, um, I'd like you to give me a, a negative and a positive from the past year. And we're gonna run around the panel in the same way. David, can you give me a negative and a positive from uh, the past year's situation. Uh, yeah, can I, can I do two negatives? Is that okay? <laughs> if the, yeah, yeah, yeah so you I'll, can. I'll yeah. be quick. Yeah, yeah um, so I, I mean, clearly for us, I mean, most of you know us as an academic professional specialist bookseller, although uh, actually we, we're a lot more than that. But I mean, in terms of our back to university, September and October was very, very difficult for us. Um, Student, students either weren't on campus or if they were on campus they were in lockdown so uh, clearly that was a it was a pretty tough uh, BTU for the shops after you know a, a difficult few months and then prepping to get everything ready and then really seeing no students at all so that was that was pretty hard. Um, the other one I would say is in terms of when we have had shops back in the limited windows that we've, we've had back as well actually a lot of our shops are in city centres um, and therefore although you know there's quite a lot of reports and, and it's great to hear Indy's doing well you know in kind of small market towns you know we've got a shop in, in Holborn in London we've got Oxford and obviously in Cambridge and Edinburgh and, and footfall there really didn't recover at all so um, you know th they would be my kind of two negatives if you like from the um, from the lockdown period. Do you want to do a positive now Dawn? Or? Yeah I'd like a positive yeah I think I'm going to each person I'm going to get you to end on a positive because I do want this not to be a, you know a filled with negative conversation so. Uh, and I promise I'm not a difficult panelist but I'll give you I'll give you two very quick positives as well. <laughs> the first one is um, just I mean all, all, all sort of you know business is serious and all the rest of it but um, actually within Blackwoods we've been really really lucky we've had virtually no cases in terms of members of staff and, and people being seriously ill with that. So, I mean, that that is a, that is a huge positive, clearly, um, before we get to the kind of the business thing. So, yeah, very, very pleased that, um, you know, all of our guys are well and uh, we've not had, you know, anything really serious uh, from that side of things. Um, I mean, the other positive would be our e-commerce sales and they've been absolutely uh, fantastic since March. So, you know, huge growth there. And, um, you know, our website and the platform has proved itself to be, you know, robust and resilient and scalable um with just you know a, a huge growth in, in sales over the past well what, what, what we'll be getting on for a year now so that's that's the positive and i think that's a very interesting thing when we're talking about e-commerce sales and digital platforms which brings us neatly on to jasper uh, what do you think have been i mean obviously there are some glaringly obvious positives that have, have been for um for your particular business model over the last year or so um but how how has it sort of how has all this felt you know your positives and negatives so i think i mean the negatives uh, bookshop.org in the uk is only three months old so i think you know the positive the negatives really are around <clears throat> the the industry that i know and love and the high street in particular and the, and the struggles that have taken place there um lots of friends that i uh don't have jobs anymore um, and so you know that side of it has been really really tough um, the positive though outside 
from those, uh, from the difficulties that I've been privileged to see the enormous ingenuity of uh, indie booksellers in particular, but general positivity around how books can um, shine a light, bring positivity to this situation. And actually that there is, there is such a community of people uh, doing incredibly positive things around books, around bringing reading to uh, different parts of society, allowing for different voices. I know, uh, Samantha, this is something that you do uh, incredibly well, but it has been truly inspiring to hear and see what indie bookshops have been able to do, um, uh, and kind of in embracing technology uh, where they've been once very scared of it, now using it as a force for good, uh, rather than it just being about um, being used by a major um, uh, Brazilian river to suck out all the uh, profit and ingenuity from uh, uh, kind of inspiration from the book selling industry, which has been, you know, that's been going on for a long, long time. But so the positive thing is the positivity that is behind um, indie bookshops and they span a huge spectrum of interest groups but the the kind of overriding thing is that that energy that is there um, I think that's I think that's a really good point and it's something that you know what right at the beginning of the um, of our AGM just now and I was saying one of the things that I felt most rewarding about the past year and most uplifting was this support of this the huge family that is the world of, of books and reading and uh and i know that you know one of the people you know sam samantha has been so, so connected with those with those networks so how have things been for you samantha with because obviously with your pop-ups and the festivals not being accessible so have there been but i mean that's obviously been a huge negative being unable to access those this year and the past year what positives <laughs> That's the cat playing the piano. That's the cat on the piano. Well, that's that in itself is a positive. Now you see, that's definitely a positive because if it wasn't for Zoom, we wouldn't have seen Samantha's cat playing the piano. Um, so, how, in terms of positives and negatives, how's this uh, this last year or so been for you? Um, well, we, I, all of us, my team and volunteers and friends and family have been really deeply challenged by the, um, you know, the pandemic because we are a traveling book carnival. We go around the country, we take lots of books, we go to schools, we go to nurseries, we do concerts and carnivals and festivals all over. So um, instinctively, one would think, well, it's been a really bad year. And yes, that was my initial reaction last March. But in fact, um, it's been a very interesting experience because it's allowed me to have to react quickly to really challenging times and situations and be incredibly creative and resourceful. And I think in the words of Maya Angelou, you know, the more creativity you use, the more you create and the more it comes. And I just feel like I've been pushed and pushed. And for me, yes, it has been really stressful at times but um the growth and the opportunity for change and, and doing things differently is just remarkable the fact that we can get over a hundred people on here and you know i can now do book fairs virtually i mean it's just the world has changed so it has been very sad and depressing for lots of people who have lost people to covid and um but from a book selling point of view I, you know, I think with all of us, we've just had to really evolve with the times and I've really enjoyed the challenge and it's given me a bigger platform and I've met some great authors and I've, you know, grown myself as well. And I've learned how to build websites and do really interesting things with my e-commerce platform that I couldn't ever dream of doing. So for that, I'm really grateful and I look forward, to, you know, to the years ahead, really, to see how this pandemic has perhaps changed the way we do things forever and I'm really interested in, in that. 
I think that that's uh, that's a very interesting thought that that it has changed things forever. We uh, our little bookshop it it is a very little bookshop, and we're in the process of uh, moving premises at the moment. And um, when lockdown came, we had to suddenly we don't have an online shop. We were just there was no way we could do an online shop. Um, but we started we had to think about how we could make money and the adaptations that we made we will continue to do we they've become so successful sort of highlighting individual authors highlighting individual books our abe shop for our antiquarian books and our click and collect and local delivery which we've actually expanded our reach in the town and reached um audience so i think that baptism of fire i often say that we all were suddenly pushed off the gangplank into the cold waters and they weren't as shark infested as we thought that they might be so i think we were avoiding doing a lot of digital things for a long time thinking it seemed like such a huge take to do to shift onto a digital world well, I, um, I was always against yeah, I just didn't like it. And I think for a lot of us, we thought, no, nope, absolutely not a tangible book in a tangible hand. I want to be. But, but being forced to look at things differently, thinking about the digital platforms, obviously, they are a good thing and they have actually expanded our reach into a different way. Um, do you feel that uh, that people are coming, will want to come back to bookshops? Do you feel that people are hungry for the physical visits still? Uh, I'll go to David first. Yeah, 100%. I mean, um, we saw after the um, the last lockdown, and it was, um, this lady filmed her, um, I would guess to be about five or six year old, um, coming back into Broad Street in Oxford. Uh, and he's literally running through the shop saying, mummy, mummy, the books are here, the books are here, you know, and it's like, you know, that, I mean, it was just, I mean, you'd have to have a hard heart not to sort of be, you know, kind of emotionally moved by this video that was on Twitter. I, I, I mean, I, I think people are desperate to get back into bookshops. Um, you know, they're really, really important spaces for community and everything else. So, yeah, I, I mean, they will come back. I think it'll be slower. Um, and I do think there will be places that, that will never actually return quite in the same way. Um, you know, we've got a shop in Holborn, as I kind of said before, you know, with people working from home, I don't really expect that will get the same footfall as it used to do before. But, you know, Broad Street in Oxford, Heffers in Cambridge, Edinburgh, Manchester, you know, the, the, you know, people will come back, you know, and I think they'll come back, come back actually quite quickly as soon as they can, really. So, uh, yeah, look, we're just looking forward to getting open again, really. And Jasper, the, the feedback that you've had from uh, people who are using bookshop.org, do you feel that it is inspiring uh, people to seek out indie bookshops as well as buy online? That they're actually, if your feedback you're getting, do you feel that people are looking to give foot traffic to these bookshops as well? Absolutely. I mean, the, what the, the most popular part of the, uh, the website currently is the find a bookshop button where you have the map and you can pick out, I think it, for all of us, that, that visual representation of how many indie bookshops there are in the UK uh, is, is really interesting. And you get, a, a, and that's only uh, Mark, uh, Mark, Mark Thornton, my colleague who, who's the bookshop affiliate manager, he, um, he's done a wonderful job in getting, we've got 410 indie bookshops signed up to bookshop.org, but that's about half of the, the shops in the UK that um, fit the criteria, kind of bookshop.org criteria of being independent. But I think, and the feedback is from all the people, all the bookshops, that their customers are desperate to get back to be able to support. I think one of the positives, um, of book uh, of bookshop uh, of the of COVID is the fact that people have found out that they can support um, indie businesses, high street businesses as a whole, and the kind of success of bookshop um, in the UK has something to do with a latent desire uh, for people to shop online, but in an ethical and socially conscious way. We've really um, there's been the major player, which has been Amazon. Um, and people don't like shopping there as much anymore. And it's not just about price, but what you're doing is you're supporting local businesses 
where money stays in the community. I'm, I'm not trying to do a big sales spiel here, but I just like the idea that actually that, that you know that income stays in those towns um, and villages and cities, and it, that's hugely powerful. I've gone off the subject slightly there. Uh, it has well. I mean. I, it's very interesting because I, I am one of those small bookshops that, that is signed up to bookshop.org and uh, it has actually, it's generated not only income for us, but um, we've had people contact us on Facebook and by emails and say, oh, I found you on bookshop.org. Where are you? And they're from, you know, they sort of live 20 miles away and they think, oh, I didn't even know you were there. And so people, you know, it has given us that extra outreach. And Samantha, I know you're... Um, you're, you know, it's it's a very different model that that you have because yours, whereas Jasper's is is essentially is is just an online, you know, but you, yours is is those pop ups. It is that festival, those physical. So, um, do you think that you'll be able to? How is your online sales doing? How is your digital presence doing? In because of course, in comparison to all your your oh, festivals well, there's, there's no comparison you know um i could go to a market um, or an event or a school and have a really really good day and sell a lot of books in a short space of time because i'm there and because what i'm selling is unique it's 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 um you know perhaps books and items that people haven't seen together in one place because they're all multicultural and bilingual from people all over from authors all over the world you know when I'm there in situ physically that's obviously going to have a big impact um, but what we've done is try to create that atmosphere online as well so we do have a website which is thisisbooklove.com it's got over a thousand books on there different titles on there and luckily my social media has grown immensely over the last four or five months so I'm able to use that platform to direct people to the website, but the sales are never going to be like how they are when I'm at a physical space or at a festival. So, you know, I'm grateful that I've got the, the website because it still does generate an income. And I really, I suppose, have had to open myself up to that online retail experience that I didn't really enjoy before um, and I never ever considered it because once someone said to me you're crazy to ever consider selling books online because of Amazon and that stuck with me for two years and I never went online because someone said that to me yeah. and then in um, March I thought well I'm going to give it a go because we had to and I literally was just you know uploading one book at a time and sadly by the time we had the interest in Black Lives Matter during May up until August September I'd already loaded you know close to a thousand books so I was prepared for this massive interest in anti-racist and multicultural and inclusive books and if I you know it's a horrible thing to say but in some ways the pandemic I'm not going to say it was good for me because I've never uttered those words but what it did was it grounded me and I stopped moving around <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere so I was forced to prepare myself for this huge interest that took place over the summer in these anti-racist books so I suppose long term I would love to see the two the online and the markets kind of work together in a very beautiful symbiotic fashion um, and who knows one day have a shop. Well, I think, I, mean, I, I think that's, um, uh, and something that you said there made me think of there's a, a, another element here. I'm gonna get sort of a, a slightly meaty question here. Um, your, your books, uh, uh, your pop-up uh, bookshops, they you quite often have books that I'm not seeing in mainstream book selling I'm not seeing in magazines I'm not seeing being marketed as heavily there, there are probably very few people here who are not familiar with my stance on celeb authors and the aggressive marketing of a very small pool of books um, over the last year and with the Black Lives Matter movement um, there there was a sudden rush of publishers to to get out a book by a black author, to put out lots of books. Now, on the one hand, that was uh, that was great to see all these 
these books coming out. Uh, and on the other, I'm still not seeing them get the same marketing and the same budgets and the same support that other authors are getting. Um, now, Samantha, your lots of the, these books I see in your collections. Do you feel that there is uh, a need for booksellers uh, to do something to stop to to turn to turn a fashion and a fad into a permanent way of being to the, have those books a sense what what is your sense that what's wrong with the industry that that is stopping that from happening um, well, <coughs> is, is that, can i answer that yes yeah, samantha to you because these are you know these are the books that i see in your collections yeah. so i'm going to come back well, to you uh, I think just to give it a bit of context, I mean, when I came into book selling, I didn't realise I was coming into book selling. I didn't know I was selling books until I, until I started doing it. I didn't have a plan to do it. I came from a television background where I was perpetually frustrated with the lack of representation on screen. And after having three children and being very tired, I just had less patience for it. So I left the TV and I when my children entered education, primary school and nursery level, I realized a lot of those emotions were coming up again because when they were bringing books home and um, you know, telling me about what they were learning at school, it didn't feel like it was representative of my family or my background. I grew up in the Caribbean, I'd lost my mum and I was, it was really important that my children had access to material that reflected the diversity of our own family. So I didn't ever come into it with a business plan or with a model of making money. So my motivation was not to find the big bestsellers or to, you know, contact publishers and ask them, you know, for their most current books or their new books. It, I was kind of coming at it from a, from a different place. I was going back to the beginning and getting back lists and going back in time to find good content. I didn't care if it was published in... 2016 or 1978 or it was a new book coming out in 2012 or whatever I wasn't interested in that so that's how I ended up I suppose amassing a really varied group of books and I would approach publishers and often a lot of the books that I did want were out of print so you know I, I started to realize very quickly and I'm still learning about the book trade because I still don't really understand it very well it's a learning process um but you know like you said about how books are marketed you know publishing companies or corporate giants they've got targets they've got sales targets just like any other industry and when they publish books they will have an allocated set of money to make that book a success to make sure that they get their return on it and to make a profit that's how I understand it works so the books that I might be interested in from, you know, 2000 years ago are not necessarily going to be books that perhaps they're investing in anymore. They've got the book, they've ticked it, they've done it and they're moving on to the next thing. So it's all about generating new content, um, content all the time. So what happens, you get these lovely, beautiful creations that were made, have been commissioned over the last 10, 15 years that get left behind um, because they're no longer relevant. So I think it's a really complicated um, discussion to be had and it, also, it comes down to commercial and financial viability. And how do you ever really challenge that? How can you ever challenge? I mean, I know that Bernadine Evaristo, um, I read recently, is looking to resurrect and inject life into some really old titles that have been forgotten about. So I'm really excited to see some of that happening because I'm a big fan of these, these, these books and it just feels like, we're in a climate now where a lot of black and brown authors are getting from some fantastic opportunities, which is wonderful. But there's a couple of, you know, my private moments, I'm often sort of looking at things a little bit more closely under the microscope and asking some uncomfortable questions about, is this, is there a sense of tokenism here? You know, what are the budget spends on these books? Is it just a one hit wonder because it's, you know, like, headlines sell papers this book will sell for a period of time but where's the longevity where's the sustainability 
you know, is this trend in anti-racist and multicultural books a serious one or is it a quick cash cow? So there's lots of questions that I'm often asking and that's because I've not really had a very positive experience as a bookseller coming into this with no experience as a bookseller and being a, wo a woman of colour. So unfortunately I am sometimes quite cynical but there are also a lot of publishers who do support me and are doing great things as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated landscape, I should say. I, I think it is. I mean, one of the things that as, as a bookseller, we've had to, as a small bookseller, we've had to actively seek out um, some books to increase the diversity on our shelves. Whereas we are aggressively approached by publishers to stock some of the biggest names. David, in terms of a, 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 you know size of Blackwells, do you feel that that you are um, that that you have to seek out books to certain authors and certain books to increase the diversity of your shelves? Is it uh, and, and do you feel that the publishers are giving the same sort of push for the to to create that diversity as a as a natural thing, or is it something that the proactive bookseller needs to do? Um. I would tend to agree that it's it's something that publishers will, are more likely to capitalise on. So, you know, not necessarily in this area, but I mean, we saw a few years ago, you know, Rebel Girls, and then that created a, a spate of books in that sort of genre. Obviously, the um, uh, Ready Edu Lodge book, you know, and 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 that's I mean, that's been our bestseller list for you know a couple of years. And then you get a situation, you know, in terms of um, what happened in America over the summer and Black Lives Matter. And, and it kind of blows up into that kind of zeitgeist thing. And, and the next minute, there are a lot of books being published. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult because, you know, I mean, from, from my perspective, I kind of deal in outcomes. And I, I guess you can level tokenism, you know, at some or, or publishers. But then I suppose if it drives people to educate themselves and learn, I, I, it, it's hard, isn't it? Then, you know, if, if the outcome of that is a positive one, for whatever reason, given the you know given the topic we're talking about, then then I guess that's kind of a good thing. I, it, but it, it's a very nuanced, complicated argument in terms of um, you know balancing off commercial, you know the kind of commercial aspects of publishing versus you know well, whether they're publishing enough books in, you know from a, in a diverse you know. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, it you, is, you can say I'm, I'm, I'm kind of. Tough, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't. I don't want to call out the publishers, but it's quite. Yeah. It's quite a difficult thing, isn't it? And, it is really difficult. Yeah. But I, you know, for me, I can only talk about my own experience, and you know, from speaking about the customers that I have and new customers that, that came to Book Love from May until um, July. I was inundated with the same with with, with the same re request for the same like five books. It was like natives, how to argue with the racist, yeah. me and white supremacy, why I no longer talk to white people about race, and so you want to talk about race. And you know, last year, if I wanted to get my hands on those some of those books, they, yeah, they weren't yeah. readily available. They weren't yeah. in print. We had to reprint. And you know, selling a lot, a lot, a lot of those books and now no one's buying them anymore. I just... Yeah. So, Which I mean, brings we, we me... Put, um, sorry, I was just... I mean, we, we do, yeah, and this, this is why it concerns me in terms of, you know, because we could be accused of tokenism and we, we did a mailing uh, in June last year, you know, basically books to explore race and racism. Mm -hmm. You know, and we'd pick things from across all genres, you know, Tony Morrison, Bluest Eye was in there, David Lammy's book was in there, David Olsoga's book was in there, you know, but... It was a mailing that, you know, would we have done that if what happened in America hadn't happened? I don't, I don't know. So, you know, I think I do. The I element mean, of being sort of, it could be leveled against us, even though, of course, it's incredibly well intentioned, and we're trying to start a debate. My um, um, my child, uh, my child is gay, and she uh, always says that um, every time I say, oh God, you know, another thing where the lesbian dies, and Eden says, don't knock it. At least there's a lesbian. <laughs> another another play where the lesbian is psychotic she's like at least there's a lesbian and I think that you know there's perhaps there's there's elements of that one of the things you mentioned about things not being in print and I think you both sort of mentioned that Jasper when I was looking at um, making book lists on bookshop.org I'm looking at some uh, we wanted to have book lists of quality and of uh, beautiful books that, that had 
that, that had uh, longevity. And we were looking at um, both new and old books throughout our list. And there's a staggering amount of incredibly good books that are out of print. Do you hope that um, some of the list making and uh, that the, the, the desire for books that could be created by list making on bookshop.org might encourage some of the publishers to bring them back into print? Yeah, I mean, the, you're absolutely right. There's a huge piece here, it alludes to what Samantha was saying about um, kind of publishers having kept things uh, under kind of RP, reprint under consideration for long periods of time so they don't see, um, so they don't lose the royalties. I think one, one of the things that we've discovered is that um, over 80% of our, the sales that we've had are for books um, we kind of sell about four, four or less of, so serious range. Um, and that's one of the things that we, we're really excited about is the fact that it, it's, um, you know, the platform does sell front list, but it's the majority is these back, is back list titles and the richness, as you talked about, Samantha, is this kind of where it's the craving for new constantly, where you've got these beautiful um, additions that are uh, that should be available. The US doesn't have the same because they've got economies of scale. They have their their backlist is is enormous, um, twice three times the size of ours. Um, but we have yeah. I think just go, kind of going back to the point on uh, kind of diversity. The the challenge that we've had previously is that book selling has been very white uh, as well. And so there haven't been bookshops that speak to different audiences. And I know at Foils we um, had, we were challenged a number of times about, so, you know, you're not making this play, place welcome for other um, communities to come in and buy books. It's white books for white people. And that, we thought we were doing something different and we definitely challenged some of it, but there is a long, way to go and that definitely it, it's about people um, different one of one of the hopes for bookshop is that it allows for a democratization of the kind of online book selling space where you've got as many voices as make up this fantastic nation uh, and that everyone has access to a place that they can um, find an audience, develop an audience, and like Samantha says, start opening bookshops. That's what we want to see, is more indies on the high street. We want more people engaged. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the utopian idea is that, you know, you get real representation of the nation rather than it being uh, just enough various people who have enough money to set up, enough capital to set up a business, hopefully, again out of some of the disruption rents come down people have better access there's more books published talking to different audiences the authors the backlist again takes on a, a new uh, um, a new capital and harnessing online as well where you've got indies who are very small like you've talked about dawn who are kind of spaced out of markets now we can see people can have manga they can have education titles the the you're not confined by the walls that you that you you are in uh, but you also have the beauty of your physical shop where you can go in and smell the paper and all those wonderful things that we get excited about as book lovers I've rambled on there again. Sorry. No, no, that's absolutely fine. So I'm thinking about, I mean, one of the nice things about this panel is that we had that, I'm lucky enough to have three people here who represent such uh, three completely different methods of uh, book selling from the large traditional uh, bookshops, from uh, the, the pop up and the sort of festival bookshop to the online retail um, arm in the, the you know, the 21st century non-Amazon based <laughs> online retail arm. So thinking about that, that that's what, what can authors do to uh, work closer and to work better with your three models? So I'm going to start with the, uh, the more traditional, the, the bookshop I'm here, David. So I'm going to start with, with you, David. What do you feel that the, the authors, illustrators, graphic novelists, what could they do to 
gain and to work better with yeah your... okay um I, I, I might start by just changing that side because we might not be who you think we are anymore i think in, ter in terms of our you know in terms of our turnover um we're a far bigger e-commerce business than we are a physical books business shops oh, really? business now yeah so i mean in the last year uh, the sales for our website, you know, are now significantly more than we take through the shops. Clearly, at the moment, the shops are closed, you know, but, you know, that, so so the, the business has pivoted um, to being kind of e-com first over shops. But there are still some world class bookshops there that must understand me. So, you know, um, in terms of Broad Street and Heifers and Edinburgh Southbridge and, and all the rest of it. Um, but, yeah, so we're, we're slightly different to how we, we may have been uh, perceived uh in the past but that's you know obviously that's fine we just changed during um uh, during lockdown i guess a little bit um i mean in terms of the authors themselves um really i mean i would i would encourage them to reach out i would encourage them to contact us um you know we are still like i said we are an indie an indie bookseller indie book selling is really really important to us indie publishing is really important to us you know so you know we don't pick books because you know, there's marketing spend behind them or anything like that. So actually, in terms of authors, you know, they should reach out to us. You know, they should contact us. They should talk to us because, I mean, my advice would be don't assume that your publisher is going to sell the book for you. You know, it's your book. You've written it. You get out there and sell it, you know. Um, so I would encourage kind of, you know, people to contact us on that front with regards to events or signings. You know, and we've got pages on our website now with signed copies. You know, there's loads of signed books on there. That's, you know hugely helpful and, and all the events and things we do um so yeah I, I would ask you know authors to actually you know come out and contact us um outside of that the other thing i'd say to authors and, it, and it's really dull but it's really really important um is actually you know go on our website go on other people's websites you know check your bibliographic information check your your dimension data which might sound like the dullest thing anybody's ever said on this call but the reality of it is, is if if you know if we're listing your book for sale on our website and that book weighs 70 grams and we say it weighs 700 grams, you ain't going to sell that book because the postage is going to be horrific. So, you know, I mean, take ownership of your book kind of at all levels, you know, make sure what people are saying about your book is right, including, let's like, say, some pretty fundamental stuff like dimension data. But in this day and age, that is actually really important. I think that's really, really good advice. And that's something that, you know, I think a lot of us probably haven't given a great deal of consideration to. Samantha, what do you think authors should do to work with you? Um, well, I think um, Jasper and, and David have, have pretty much said, you know, everything on that. I think that, I think authors are amazing. I think they're very special and they have a gift to write and amazing things but sometimes I find you know some of the authors not all of them but perhaps don't like the spotlight so they perhaps shy away from some of the publicity um, so I would always advise authors to you know get in touch and come up with ideas on how we can collaborate you know it's got to be um, a mutually beneficial um, arrangement. Now we do get a lot of authors contacting us at Book Club, a lot of self-published authors who I absolutely love and I'm constantly apologising to them because I get so many and I'm not always able to respond. So if there are any out there listening, if I haven't responded, it doesn't mean that I don't love your book or I don't think you're great. I'm, I'm just so stretched because often it's just me and one other person trying to do it and my other colleague has left. Um, she's unwell. So um, what I think that authors need to do more of as well is perhaps put a little bit of pressure on their publishers and make sure that their pub if they feel confident enough to do that, to speak to their publishers and say, how are you marketing my book? I'm not an author, so I don't know what the relationship is like between an author and a publisher, whether the author can actually have those conversations. Um, I'm sure it could be quite sensitive, but from my point of view, I would like to see authors supporting bookshops as well if they can speak to their publishers and say have you contacted this small black owned book bookshop are they stocking my book I really want to do something with them because in all the years that I've been doing this on and off I can probably count on two fingers when a publicist from a 
big publisher has ever got in touch with me and said we want to help we want you to have we want we want to do some publicity with you around your book they don't check for us so if the author aligns with our principles and aligns with book love and aligns with some of the work that we're trying to do within the community put some pressure on the publishers and make them accountable say are you making sure this book is getting in the hands of a black um publisher or an independent or a small publisher um sorry bookseller and is there a spend to help the smaller independent bookshops as well to to publish you know to to promote the book i hope that makes sense i kind of got my publishers and my all my peas mixed up. <laughs> but i think i think that's really important as well i think for a lot of authors they assume that their publishers are um, I think maybe it's, you know, particularly when you're first starting out, you assume that your publisher is contacting all the bookshops in the world to see. They're probably contacting two or three large chains because it's it's time consuming to contact all of those. And, uh, and, and if your book isn't in all the catalogues, uh, then your books that are, you know, we get we get heaps and heaps of catalogues. We can't if we sat there and read the whole copies of, you know, we, we can't sit there. A bookseller cannot physically sit there and read through the 30,000 odd books that are going to be published every year. So a proactive approach. We, we have had quite, you know, people who seek us out and say, have you seen my book? Um, and I think that looking on the book, you know, particularly independent books, look at what their specialists are. Look at what their specialisms are. Our little bookshop, we have Scottish interest poetry. Yeah. Um, children's fiction particularly Scottish writers we still get contacted by American writers of American books and say well we don't stock you so save yourself a lot of time by doing a bit of research and search for the people who will stock your stuff um, Jasper obviously <laughs> this is a completely different model because we've got the affiliates thing so um, what can authors do with bookshop.org I think, first of all, the, the thing that I would say is that, um, you know, do get in contact with your local bookshops, making sure that you have those connections where they're appropriate. But second of all, is, is that, you know, bookshop.org is designed for authors um, and to become an affiliate. It's an incredibly useful tool to be able to market yourselves, um, that you can create a narrative between you and your followers um, think of bookshop.org as a kind of virtual bustling high street where you've got loads of different people on the street with their shop windows. You can create curate lists so you become part bookseller, part author, part publisher. Um, and it, it's, it's really democratic in so far as anyone can be on there from somebody who's self-published through to um, somebody who's got million pound marketing spend. It's there to work in conjunction with lots of different elements. It's not a silver bullet. It's not supposed to be the, the way to, uh, to cure all the ills of publishing, um, but it is one of the things that you can utilize to help with your profile and to, you know, to talk, as I say, to your followers and readers that you already have, but potentially to look at, at, at new ones because you've got lots of different um, people viewing bookshop.org um, loads of people on that high street and that's that's the benefit but primarily bookshop.org is there for the to to promote indie bookshops um, and i would always say that it's, it's it's definitely worth making contact with your local shop and working and building lists with them and then getting getting them to promote you and that kind of virtuous circle essentially I'll say there's also, of course, I um, mean, you can follow them on Twitter and there's, uh, there's it's IndieBookshops.com and they are at Indie Bookshop UK and they have a large map of, of Indie Bookshops online so you can have a look and you can scroll through those. Um, I think that one of the things that we're getting here is that there is that perhaps a lot of us still need to embrace. I think for a lot of authors, people, they still feel uncomfortable blogging themselves they still feel un slightly uncomfortable selling their work I think that, that you know we all feel it's a bit somehow uh, well we just feel a bit uncomfortable it's not our strength I think for a lot of authors it's not their personal strength to sell their work I think a lot of us feel 
or it's a bit imposter syndrome. So what I'd like to do is uh, we've got sort of a hundred odd people here. And one of the things that's important about things like committees like Scooby and like the, the CWIG is these are our networks. I think if we stand for each other and help sell each other's work. So every time one of us sees a bookshop that you think, oh, so-and-so's book would be great in this one. And this is the kind of specialist that would work with this pal's book. Let's start, let's really plug each other. Let's make these networks really work and start selling things for each other. But we're kind of running to the end of our, our time now. And I'm aware that some people have got to, um, got to drop off. So I apologies if we haven't managed to get to people's questions. Uh, but what I'd like to do is I would like to um, let our panel each ask a question and we can carry on the conversation um, online and after this people um, if we use the hashtag CWIG21 CWIG21 hashtag CWIG21 and we'll take this over on social media and um, I would like our each of our panel members to ask a question of the authors that are here and we'll take the conversation, we'll continue on online. So I'm gonna to go to Jasper first. What question would you like to ask? What sort of feedback would you like from our members? I think the most useful one is to, to flip round the question that you asked Dawn, which is, you know, what can, um, what can booksellers best do for authors? Uh, and what, what would you like? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, as I've talked about this kind of community of booksellers that is on bookshop.org and they, it's great to be able to use that forum to, to, to talk to them about what authors are up to. Um, so yes, that's my one. I what like that a lot. Yeah. So, so what, what, what do you want? <laughs> what, <laughs> what do you want people? Tell us what you want. David, what would you like to ask? Oh, I'm going. To, I, it's going to sound like a complete fudge, but I, I would say the same. I mean, there's there's very little direct linking between the bookshops and the authors. The publisher is in the middle there, so it is actually quite hard for us to know what authors want. You know, directly, it's it's always through a filter, you, or usually through a filter. So, you know, in I love terms that, of, yeah. yeah, I mean, how we how we better support authors? You, look, you tell us. But I, you know, like Jasper says, you know, and, and speaking as you know. A very big indie but you know nevertheless you know bookshops don't put many barriers in the ways we're not we're not difficult people to deal with you know so you know i like say i would say it's an open door just tell us what you want you know and i'm, I'm sure we can facilitate that and I, I think that's really important because, you know, the book, booksellers, uh, this, this should be a symbiotic relationship. We can't do it without you. You can't do it without us. That's that definitely should be how that works. And uh, Samantha, what would you like to ask the members? Oh, hi. Yeah, I've just had a message from someone saying that they couldn't really hear me properly. Have you, have you guys? Been I could hear you. Yeah, I could mm. hear you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I want to put myself in the shoes of an author. And I want to understand if an author can put a bit of pressure on publishers to, um, you know, how how much how much influence do they have over a publisher's decisions on where to on and how to publicise their book? Do they have any influence over publishers' promotion of their books? I'm really interested in that. I think that's um, I think that's something that a lot of people will be interested in. Well, so that's a couple of interesting questions to take over to hashtag Seawig21. We talk about what uh, what do authors want from booksellers? What do authors expect from booksellers? Uh, how do they see that relationship? And also, what what say do authors really have about 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 publicity and marketing and and how that relationship? is how their relationship is between their book and the booksellers. I think that's quite an interesting conversation. Um, now we've kind of reached our time. I'm very sorry that we haven't managed to, to get to everyone's question. I'm even more sorry that we didn't have the full 155 people here because that would have been absolutely amazing. Um, Joe, was there anything else that we needed to cover? <laughs> Um, there are a few points about um, one author wanted to know about whether um, they were personally boycotting um, Amazon and felt whether that was detrimental to their career, whether they should feature themselves on Amazon. She wanted to know what other authors thought about that. There were quite a few comments and questions about 
um, supermarkets and places like WH Smith remaining open on the high street and whether that was an unfair um, commercial advantage to, to those stores. Lots of comments about reaching new audiences and hybrid shops and what booksellers might do in the future to get more footfall, whether that's digital or physical. And um, also there's lots of comments about putting more um, different types of multicultural authors and books onto exam boards and perhaps that would drive sales um, of, of those authors. So that's what's kind of- I think those are all really interesting points. And I think if we can take those over to um, the ongoing discussion as well, because I think in certainly in terms of like, do we boycott Amazon? That's not a yes or no answer because I know we've discussed this many times with Seawig that lots of our independent authors and lots of developing authors and emerging authors have benefited hugely from um, Amazon as, a, as an independent publishing platform and we would never want to obviously create a blockage to people who have made quite a nice living out of selling things on that. I think there's a question of ethics, personal ethics, business ethics and balance um, so we would never, we would never suggest that anyone would boycott, but it's certainly a discussion that's worth having. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for coming today and for making such a valuable discussion. And um, I wanted to end on one little note that I, uh, uh, all the feedback I'm having from schools and uh, from uh, at small bookshops is how in how excited people are and how desperate people are to get back to having real events and real author visits and having more physical things. And I want to end, we're currently moving our bookshop to a new premises. And one of the first jobs that I have to do every morning during the process of moving in is to clean the nose prints off the window where people have literally pressed their noses against the window because they're so desperate to come in and they're seeing what's going on. I see that as a sign of a future where when our doors are open and our foot traffic goes up, I think that there's a whole generation of people who are so sick of screens <laughs> that the physical book is going to take a little bit of a surge. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And um, here's to a time when we can have that warm white wine and nibbles again. Thank you very much. <laughs>